Hi, everyone. This is Roland Fisher, lead pastor of Second City Church here in Chicago, Illinois, and we hope you're well. Welcome to our streaming of our service. We hope you're edified today by our worship, the preaching and teaching of the word, and you leave full of faith and courage to take the kingdom of God wherever you might go in joy and great strength as we look to honor our King and God together. God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Hi, everyone. My name is Roland Fisher, and I'm the lead pastor here at Second City Church. Hey guys, my name is Cole Parlier, and I'm associate pastor here at Second City Church. We wanted to welcome you to our streaming service and tell you a little bit about what we do as a church. So at Second City Church, we're all about the three C's. The first and most important is Christ. Mm -hmm. Because of who he is and what he has done for us, we come together to worship him. The second C is community. We believe that because of Jesus Christ, he's made a new family and a new community. And we want to live life together doing that. And the third C is culture. We believe that this message of Christ and the forgiveness of sins in this community is for the entire culture, all people, everywhere. So we hope you leave this service today encouraged, full of faith, and ready to take the kingdom of God into every sphere where you touch. Mm -hmm. God bless you, and we'll see you soon. All right. Hello, everyone. This is Roland Fisher, the lead pastor of Second City Church here in Chicago, Illinois, and it's good to be with you again. Uh, if you have been like uh, many of the people uh, throughout our city and throughout the world, uh, you've been on lockdown for the past several days, and uh, many of you are uh, extroverts like myself and are dying little deaths every day inside. And uh, for those of you who are introverts, just realize that uh, people know that you're home and you do have your cell phone. So when you're not responding, yes, they know that you can see it. Okay, so anyway, it's good to see you tonight and uh, today or whenever you might be viewing this. And I'm happy to be continuing to share this message with you. We hope you were encouraged last week as we continued our Lenten series. Uh, which is called Famous Last Words, The Parables of Jesus, and we're encouraged about how to really entrust the talents that God's given you to him for the advance of his kingdom purposes. Uh, today, we want to continue with this same series, but speaking about a different topic as this present crisis continues to unfold. And what we wanted to talk about as we go into the next parable of Jesus today is uh, something that will hopefully really allow you to have a new foundation of faith as you go forward, whether you are coming into this message already serving Jesus or are just considering him because somebody passed this message on to you. We want you to have a foundation for your faith that will keep you both in good times as well as challenging ones. And so today, as far as a focus is concerned, we're going to uh, start with this. Uh, we're going to start with this idea that God wants us to be ready to receive and give his love whenever and however it's needed. I'll repeat that. God wants us to be ready to receive and give his love whenever and however it's needed. Now, to discuss that today, we're going to do it uh, as we usually do in three parts. And we're going to talk about it first in understanding why, in fact, the idea of secularism, which most people live in today, fails. We're going to talk about the fact that secularism does not fully provide an answer to the challenges or needs of the day, whether it be the needs that we're facing presently or uh, many of the challenges that we face on an annual basis. Secondly, we're going to talk about the love of God in the midst of crisis, that the love of God is the answer in times of challenge and need, whereas secularism fails the love of God is in fact the answer in times of challenge and need. And then finally, number three, we're going to talk about the gospel at just the right time. How Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is in fact the perfect reference point for giving love at just the right time exactly as it's needed. So if you have a Bible today, uh, Bible today go ahead and open with me to Matthew chapter 25. We're going to talk about a familiar passage to many of you, the parable of the sheep and the goats. And uh, as we talk about that, we'll get into the message. So it says in verse 31, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And as Christians, that's what we look forward to, the coming of Christ and him sitting on his glorious throne. 
before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my, of my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, when you look at this scripture, it's, uh, it's again, uh, one that begs a question, why do we have this as a point of focus during this time? Well, I think it's, uh, it's good to say that right now, here and now, everybody's searching for a reason to have hope. Everybody's searching for a reason to have confidence and faith as markets are crashing, as people are being laid off in their jobs, as the economy is suffering, and even people's health and well-being is uh, deteriorating. We see that people are looking for an anchor to their souls. But whenever we look at a scripture like this, I think we can start with the idea that secularism as a modern concept or as a modern idea has failed us during this time. And in any time that we have challenge or crisis, it will inevitably fail us. And the, way, the why is because it will never fully provide an answer to the challenges or the needs of the day. Now, you hear the word secularism, and the first question that you ask is, what meaneth this, Rollin? What are you talking about when you're talking about secularism? Well, when we speak of secularism, what we're talking about or referring to are worldviews. Their attitudes and activities devoid of an acknowledgement of God and that really have no religious or spiritual basis about them. Today, as you're watching this, you might find yourself in that position. You might consider yourself an intellectual or an academic. You might consider yourself somebody who really, things are going well for you besides the coronavirus, and we really have no need of religious things. That would be a secular mindset. But what we see is that in uh, another parallel instance of trial and tragedy, in 1606, there was a man named William Shakespeare, the great author who, during the plague that swept England in 1606, he was also quarantined in his home. And during that time, during that period, he penned a few small pieces. You might recognize them. He penned Antony and Cleopatra. In isolation, he penned King Lear, and he penned Macbeth. And if that's not a challenge to you, I don't know what is. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing during my quarantine, but this is what he did. <laughs> and one of the things that William Shakespeare had Macduff say in Macbeth is this. He said, each new morn, new widows howl, new orphans cry, and new sorrows strike heaven on the face. 
And whenever we see these realities of the challenges of life, we have to ask ourselves the question, does our worldview give us anything to cope with these realities? How secularism, we think, attempts to respond to it, these issues is this, that it attempts to provide an answer to the rumblings through humanistic secular altruism, meaning that people try to do their best to do good in the midst of trials and tribulations. But if you study the history of secularism, you'll find that much of it had its root in Western culture. And to that point, Christianity historically had a great influence on Western culture and bequeathed the ideas of caring for the poor, pushing back on injustices, and helping the suffering. So even in secularism's do-good or thrust, we see that it had its roots in Jesus and the things that Jesus promoted for his followers to obey. The issue today, though, is that people don't want to give credit where credit is due. It's no different than what the Apostle Paul said in Romans whenever he said, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God who actually gives the solution to the ills in which we find ourselves for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. When we try to approach trials and we try to deal with suffering without God, the challenge we find in secularism is that while it makes strides towards humanitarian efforts, at its root, it attempts to create heaven on earth. And in secularism, there's a search for fulfillment in such tangible anchors as romantic relationships. Lord knows I ran after those. I was a serial dater. People try to have an anchor in their career, financial stability, their beauty, and their health. The problem, though, is that when times of suffering arise, there's no answer for the pain caused by the removal of these idols. And an idol is anything that you try to set up before or in place of God. When these things are removed from us, there's no answer to the pain when these idols in which we placed our temporary hopes are destroyed. And that's the issue with secularism. But here, you see Jesus immediately coming in to respond to that problem. Jesus begins the parable by addressing the reality that one day he will judge all of the nations of the earth. There will be a separation that day between those who are approved of him and those who are not. There's a correlation to how we respond to others in times of need and how the judge will respond to us. Those in Jesus' parable came upon times where they suffered the loss of basic necessities, the loss of relationship, and the loss of freedoms. Some of you, for the first time, are experiencing that in your life. A loss of basic necessities, a loss of relationship, not being being able to be around those you know and love, the loss of freedoms. And it's in this place that the secular are looking for love and comfort that only God can provide. The good news, though, is that one of the ways that God practically provides this love is through his people, the church. Through his people, the church. Now, if we know that what people are looking for, God provides the answer and his church is the means through which he provides it, We can think of why Blaise Pascal, the French philosopher and mathematician, said this about Christianity and religion. He said, men despise religion, here meaning Christianity, and they hate it and are afraid it may be true. The cure for this is first to show that religion is not contrary to reason, but worthy of reverence and respect. Next, make it attractive, make good men wish it were true, and then show that it is. This is the power 
of the love of God coming in to address that which secularism cannot answer. And really, the answer that God has to the lack of answers in secularism is his love. And the love of God in crisis is clearly seen during times of challenge and need. In the parable, you see that Jesus begins by talking about people in need. We don't know why they are, we just know that they are. And the beauty of this parable is that it's not limited to times like the spread of COVID-19. It is practically applied to all of the troubles that people face in all times, in all places, in all different circumstances. And the righteous, while people are suffering, are called to a life of sharing the love of God with those in need. Jesus clearly says that what we choose to do for his people in times of need, ultimately, we're doing for him. So ultimately, you are beginning to see the expansion around you of those with different practical needs. How will we respond? Jesus said, with his love. Jesus said, with meeting people where they find themselves in their suffering. And in light of this, the reward of the righteous as we do this, according to Jesus, is eternal life. But the judgment of the selfish will ultimately be eternal punishment. Now, when I think about these things, it's, it's often like a combat that immediately rises up in my soul thinking about how I used to believe that in times just like this, you either need faith or you need science. I was a pre-med student growing up, and uh, my first leaning was one of science. Didn't really have much faith. And the beauty of what the church is doing today is one, they're one of the proponents of providing both a practical, tangible hope in today's times and an eternal hope in the life to come. There was a recent article in Time Magazine that talked about the interaction between the religious community and the faith community. And the, one of the authors in this article said this, that the interaction between religious and scientific communities can sometimes be inhibited by a perception that they don't share the same worldview. But my research shows that scientists often do their work out of a core value to heal the world around them. In my interviews with religious scientists, yes, that's a real term, religious scientists, I've found that many of them feel similarly about their work and their goals, sometimes drawing on the concept of shalom, a Hebrew word that broadly refers to seeking peace, harmony, well-being, and prosperity that result from the flourishing of all creation. One immunologist told me not long ago, I see science as an amazing tool to intervene on the human condition. What does that have to do with what we're talking about in Jesus' parable? It's this, that the very shalom, the peace that God's trying to be bring, bring in these troubled times comes not just through the facts that are being offered for us in the midst of helping us know our boundaries and our needs and our social distancing, <laughs> parameters, but also the shalom that comes from the peace that's given through faith. There was a man named Randy Woodley who said Jesus properly understood as shalom coming into the world from the shalom community of the Trinity is the intention of God's once and for all mission. That whenever Jesus showed up, he showed up for times such as these. He showed up to bring his peace in the midst of the calamity. He showed up to bring his healing in the midst of the distress. That is the mission of birthing and restoring shalom to the world is in Christ, by Christ, and for the honor of Christ. Whenever we're propelled by God to be the love of God to the world that's so shaken up around us right now when secularism has failed them, it is because he's bringing his shalom through us. And that's what the parable is about. You are literally a carrier of his presence. You are a carrier of his peace. You are a carrier, people of God, of his good news to humanity that's stuck in bad news. 
And the key to being this shalom to the world is being what people need when they need it. That's what the parable is talking about. We minister according to the demand and wisdom of God for the day. And so we see both faith and wisdom interacting with one another in such a way that the people of God actually display the wisdom of God as well as the love of God. When social distancing and self-quarantine are the order of the hour, out of love for others, we inconvenience ourselves to give it. We all want to touch somebody, but social distancing is the demand of the day, and it's the love of God to express that. When it's prayer for sickness or protection, the love of God is we offer it. When it's a call for encouragement, picking up that phone and speaking to somebody you might not have talked to in the past several months or even years, we make it. When it's temporary support after layoffs while someone diligently surf, searches for new employment, as the body of Christ, we look to give it. And the point is, is that love has no formula, only the discernible character of Christ. And in times just like these, when secularism fails us, Christ does not. And through his church, he's promoting his gospel peace and love. And it's why the gospel comes at just the right time. We encouraged you last week to be prepared to share the gospel whenever you can, with whomever you can. This is our, our church. And if we look to Jesus continually, we see that when secularism has failed humanity and the love of God is the answer to the needs that people actually have, we see that Jesus sacrificed on the cross is the perfect reference for giving love at just the right time, exactly as it's needed. And whether it be your trial or helping another through their trial, Jesus can be found. Jesus keeps himself not at a distance, but is right in the middle of distress. You see, all those people, whether they were in prison or they were a foreigner or a stranger, needing some relationship, or they were somebody who was sick, or they were somebody who needed food, clothing, or shelter. They were in distress, but Christ was saying, I was right there with them, in the midst of it. And that comforting fact is what brings us to the reality that when we're in his hands, the circumstances may change, but his love remains the same. You might have had grandparents who said to you often after their years of living, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. I appreciate even my father-in-law who was a, a World War II baby. He was a, an official baby boomer. But I love his posture during this time because having lived through some things, he, as a man of God, has seen Jesus through love and loss. He's seen him through plenty and in want. He's seen him when people have gotten sick and even losing those who are near and dear to him. But in the midst of it, he understands that because the cross remains right smack dab in the middle of his thinking, God's love for him and love for us all remains the same. Think about even God calling people, some of you even today, in the midst of your upending and struggle to repentance. And whenever the, Paul, the Apostle Paul continued to speak, he said this. He said, do you presume on the riches of his, meaning God's kindness, and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Do you know that you, Christian, can be the kindness of God towards somebody helping to them to experience the love of God, seeing them come through the proclamation of the gospel to repentance and faith? And do you know that maybe somebody who's helping you right now might be an answer to prayers that were prayed for you? And it's God's kindness towards you, trying to lead you to repentance and faith through the everlasting, unchanging love of God. Now we 
we know that our doctors, nurses, and first responders are literally heroes on the front lines right now who need our prayers. Yet the rest of the church has a role to play as people are, as I said, already losing their jobs, dealing with supply shortages and illness. When secularism fails, inevitably failing to provide solace in the midst of idle crushing trials, the power of God's gospel is that it meets people presently in their suffering to provide both a present and eternal hope. I want to repeat that. When secularism fails, inevitably failing to provide solace in the midst of idol crushing trials, the power of God's gospel is that it meets people presently in their suffering to provide both a present and eternal hope. It's God's gospel at the right time in the right measure. Paul went on to say this in Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 6. He says, I come at just the right time and in just the right measure. He said, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So anyone who ever thinks God doesn't understand my suffering, let me tell you, God in the flesh God incarnate understands suffering. And we know that, again, because of the cross. He says, for a while we were still weak, at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's not just talking about the fact that we were in troubled times. It's also that we were set against him. When we were set against him and the consequences of our poor choices were coming upon us for being set against him, it's in that moment that he loved us. He said, it's in that moment that I came for you. It's in that moment of suffering or pain that I express my love for you. While you were weak, while you were bound, while you were disconnected, he said, I came for you. Since therefore we have now been justified, which means counted innocent by his blood, when you repent and turn your life over to him, believe the good news of what Jesus did for you on the cross, taking the punishment, the sin and the shame for you so that you could have new life and eternal life in him. He said, when we do this, we're justified in him. And he says, because we've been justified by by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. What this means is ultimately that God is coming even during times of suffering. You see that in the midst of the parable to express his love, to break down the shortcomings of secularism and bring us back into relationship with himself so that we have a brand new foundation. One that's sure one that's steadfast, one that's full of hope and that that brings eternal life to come. He says, I want to give this to you, but it's not, sometimes for some of you, it takes a shaking just like this. I know that was true for me. I was a hard-headed man, a hard-headed young man growing up. You didn't have to tell me things once or twice, three times or 10 times. I had to learn often by experience not just by somebody pleading with me. But in that moment, Christ came for me while I was still a rebel. In that moment, Christ came for me when I was bringing suffering upon myself, when I was experiencing suffering that was thrust upon me that I had nothing to do with. You see, there are all different types of categories that bring suffering into the world. But in the midst of it, Christ says, I'm coming for you. Find me in the midst of it. Church, show the love in the midst of it so that people can find him. But you've got to first know that he's with you. 
And this is the reality that will ultimately keep us during times of suffering and propel us to care for others, sharing the good news of the gospel despite others' merit or their projected worth. And let me say this, the, the, the reality is, is that it's both the high and low in society that need the cross of Christ. See, everybody now is under a threat. When we look at this parable, many times people only think about those who somehow are in some sort of fiscal or financial need, but that's not what he's talking about. It's those who are poor in spirit, those who are deprived in their soul and have no anchor for their soul. He said this good news, this love of God wants to come to all of them today. But I want to end by saying this. We need never be confused. You must put your faith in Christ because he is true, not because he's useful. I'm going to say that again. You must put your faith in Christ because he is true, not because he's useful. Though, when you submit to him as true, you will also find the benefits of trust in him. See, that's the juxtaposition with the shortcomings of secularism. Secularism fails us, but then we come to not just an idea, but him who is true, the historic Jesus of Nazareth, who walked the earth, performed miracles, drove out demons, raised the dead, went to the cross, and then was raised to life himself after three days to live and rule forever victoriously, coming and making his return but we receive all the benefits of who he is and what he's done when we acknowledge him, not as a means to an end, but the end itself. And times of shaking, just like these, bring us to that point where we say, what is the rock on which my life is being built? Has it been the secular ideas of relationships, financial stability, health, or has it been the eternal one who holds all things together by the power of his spoken word? I would say today that wherever you find yourself, whether Christian or somebody who's just trying to figure things out, that you hear the appeal of Christ today to say in the midst of the suffering, I am there and I'm trying to make myself known to you to reconcile you to me through the cross. So in summary, Let's leave the shortcomings of secularism. Let's embrace the love of God. And let's have a reference point of the cross of Jesus Christ, which can not only redeem, but save us both in good times and in bad. In his mighty name, amen. I'd like to end by praying today. And I ask that you would uh, join me in this prayer. Father God, I'm asking that even as we finish this message today, that everyone would take an inventory of their lives before you and where they have built on things that are really so fleeting and so temporary. Times like this show us what really is lasting and that which is not. Father, I'm asking that people wouldn't anymore give themselves to running after that which they can't hold on to, but they would actually run after you who looks to hold on to them and never let them go. God, I'm asking you that people would not only receive the love of God during this time, but also be filled up to the place that they can give it. But it would only come because they respond to the good news of Jesus and the cross, that immutable, unchangeable event that took place in history showing us that God Almighty laid down the life of his own son so that he could get a hold of those in the, of us who are in the midst of our suffering, our pain, and our fears because of the sin lives that we lived. God, I'm asking you that you would bring us all to a new place of revelation and foundation in you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you for being with us today. God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord, and we'll see you next week. 
Hey everybody, thanks again for joining us today. We're so glad to be online with you. We hope you enjoyed the service and wanted to let you know that this is at least gonna be going on until April 21st. So get prepared to join us live at 10 a.m. on Sundays where this will be streamed. And then also we wanted to remind you guys that all of the community groups now have a virtual element to them. So go to our website, find the group you're interested in, click on it, and you'll be direct on how to join each of these groups virtually. So please make sure to stay in community. And then lastly, wanted to remind you that you're able to give online by going to the website, you'll be redirected to PushPay, or you can text the number on the slide behind me and you can give that way as well. Thanks so much. Hope you're blessed and encouraged by the message today. Some of you have been watching today and felt the prick of the Holy Spirit in your heart. You might have been considering the things of God for a while, but really things made sense to you maybe for the first time or were reinvigorated for you today. And we want to give you an opportunity to seize this moment and to really respond to God. It's not enough that we hear the good news about Jesus. It's important that we respond to him in kind. He's making an invitation. We must receive it. And so today, if you receive the good news that Jesus Christ came as the perfect son of God to live the life that you should have lived and on that cross died the death for your wrongdoing and rebellion against God that you should have died. And today say, I don't want death and hell, but I want to receive the forgiveness that he has for me. Then you can make a commitment to him today. And if you're making that commitment, would you pray this prayer with me? Father God, I thank you for your love for me. And I thank you for sending Jesus to live a sinless life in my place and on the cross die the death that I should have died. I acknowledge that because he was sinless three days later, you raised him from the dead so that I could have, through my repentance and turning away from my misdeeds, forgiveness of sins and new life in you. Make me a new person today. Forgive me, cleanse me, and show me how to walk with you and serve you, loving you the rest of my days in Jesus' name. You see, the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And so if you prayed that prayer, believing and confessing, the good news is today you're starting a new life. But what we want to do is give you an opportunity to get connected, to learn how to walk out this new life. And if you've made a commitment today, please visit us at secondcitychurch.com slash new life. There you'll find some information about how to take these next steps in Jesus, get connected to a God-fearing, God-loving community, and learn how to love him as he's loved you. So God bless you, and let's start this walk together. Music